week three, Applied Linguistics for Interpreters. And today is October 22nd, 2024. Now, I've noticed that not everybody has logged in to Virtuale. So can you please encourage everybody to check the material? Because I can actually see when people last logged in. So if I see that somebody never accessed the content, then I'm, you know, beginning to be concerned that they're, um, you know, not following. So um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I have um, a couple of appointments with the technicians, the technical supports. I've opened a YouTube, they've helped me open up a YouTube channel in the Department di Interpretazione and we put one of the videos up from one of the classes and um, tomorrow I have another meeting to sort of uh, upload the other ones so we, I'm doing it properly, I'm doing it through like the institutional channel and the nice thing about having the videos on YouTube is that you can activate automatic captions and uh, I looked at the quality of one of the captions. So the whole purpose is to think about how technology can help us give access to content in conditions where typically you wouldn't, you wouldn't activate those kinds of supports, right? So lectures are imperfect in the sense that they are, well, noisy, there's, um, they're, they involve, hello, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I was just saying, uh, tutto a posto a casa, con, avete siete stati? evitato di passare perché venivo da, dalla Maremma quindi ho fatto la E45 per evitare di passare da Maremma però ci sono ritardi nei treni o no? Ah, ho capito sì sì They canceled it. Yeah. Uh, and they closed the platform. Oh, oh, actually. The tracks. They actually closed the tracks. Uh huh. Flooding. <laughs> yes. Well, it's new normal. You know, it's. Anyway. So, I. Yeah. The tracks. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, please uh, log into Virtuale. Good morning. <laughs> and I am working on having the videos on the YouTube channel so we can activate automatic captions. And on YouTube, you can, the speech recognition system isn't bad, it makes errors on some things, some of them are predictable. Uh, so like names, but it actually does a pretty good job when I speak English. If I switch to Italian, it stops, obviously. Uh, you can also then do the automatic capture, the translation of the automatic captions, and that's actually not so good. So it gets the semantics, the interpretation wrong a lot. So it kind of does okay locally, but it really, the, the quality of the Italian captions is, is um, degraded. So. I'll say more about that tomorrow when I have my second meeting with a, um, with, with a technician so that we can actually put all of them up. And I will just give you the access code to access, anybody who has that access code can actually watch them and then um, comment on them. So the point is, um, the captions are imperfect. Normally you wouldn't be cap you know, captioning, and, and they're imperfect in the sense that they have inaccuracies. 
So they wouldn't satisfy accessibility standards for the deaf, right? Because you can't just put automatic captions and say on and just say I've solved the problem. Then there's also other issues with automatic captions. Automatic captions actually transcribe everything, including the speech errors or the revisions that a person produces. Okay, so um, it's it's interesting that like what consequences does that have? on, for example, somebody who's using captions but for different purposes, um, including if you're using captions to support your um, simultaneous or consecutive interpretation, right? So, um, having said that, I think I'm a difficult part in uh, PowerPoint, yes. So if I do multi-language, if I switch between languages, it doesn't do a good job. You're all okay with me recording the video? Yes. And with the understanding that if we make those videos available on YouTube, I will send you the link. Good morning. Anybody with that link can look at them. Okay? So if you're ever uncomfortable, anything that you said but after the fact, you, you think, oh, I don't want this for whatever reason, just let me know, okay? And we're recording them for sort of for educational purposes, for, for educational use. So um, here are topics. I said I'm, I'm deliberately following the book uh, so that you actually have the whole content um, explained to you in accessible language. The book is accessible, it has um, a glossary, it has flashcards, right? So you can actually um, access the content of the book and there's more on the website in your own time, more than, than what I can cover in class. And what I do is I, I sort of try to steer, you know, sort of guide the presentation of the material and integrate it with uh, external material. We are still covering language production, how it is that humans turn or translate, in fact, thinking into speaking. If I were to say, you know, what is language production? It's how do we turn non-linguistic cognition into linguistically expressed meaning. That's what we're doing, okay? And so we're looking at it through the lens of different disciplines, uh, mostly disciplines that look at the cognitive aspects of language. And the evidence that, in fact, when we're speaking, even if we have this perception that we're in fact, doing something automatic, like I have a thought, I say it in language, it actually, that, that simplicity, or that immediacy, simply reflects the fact that we're very skilled at doing it. It doesn't mean that it's a simple operation. And we know this through different perspectives. A lot of the evidence that the book presents has to do with errors. Now, speech errors, and not all the errors that a speaker can actually make. So somebody asked me about second language so-called errors. Let's not call them errors, but if you're saying I'm deviating a second language uh, or somebody who's speaking a dialect that they weren't, they didn't grow up with. Okay, so it's not just about, like if I was living in Veneto for a while and there was no way if I tried to speak with a Veneto accent, I would, I would deviate from how a Veneto person speaks, right? Now that's not an error. Okay, that kind of or systematic patterns that have to do with your L1 or your dialect. Okay, those are not error, not those are interesting for from from for other approaches, for example, for second language acquisition and so on. But um, errors, these are errors everybody makes in a language or a dialect that they are perfectly skilled at. And they are unintentional deviations from what message you intended to say. So it presupposes that you already know what you want to say, but something goes wrong in the execution of that translation or mapping from, from uh, the thought to the different levels of linguistic encoding. And we said that there's evidence from how we speak that speakers can make morphological errors, they can make phonological errors, they can also make errors that result in expressing a meaning that sometimes is the opposite of what you intended, like saying, you know, the cat was chased by the rat, or the rat chased the cat when what you actually intended to say, and that's the meaning you wanted to say, was the opposite. Okay, so chapters four, five, and six, that completes the production part, 
have to do with morphological errors. Again, there's lots of examples of speech errors at the morphological level. I'll, I've summarized them on the slides. I'll go a little bit quickly because you find this content in the book. Okay, so I'll speed up on some of those slides. But when you study or when you print them out for the exam, you have them there. You have some of the examples there, but they're all taken from the book. And then monitoring and repair, this has to do with the fact that there's reasons to believe that speakers monitor their speech, including not just consciously, but also unconsciously, and we'll see how. And then tomorrow we'll talk about co-speech gesture. Okay, so speakers gesture when they speak, what kinds of gestures are they, what functions gestures play, uh, what consequences are there if you prevent somebody from gesturing, okay? If you prevent somebody from gesturing, like you tie their hands, what happens? What do you think? Yes, but it does have a consequence on, interestingly, it actually has a consequence on lexical retrieval. So if you actually don't allow people to gesture, it's harder to find words. Okay, so it actually has a, um, we'll, we'll talk about this. So the use of gesture in speaking. Okay, so last week we left off, you know, with sort of this question about how is it that we store words in our heads, especially morphologically complex words. And these are examples from English. We know that English has an impoverished morphology compared to Italian, to Russian, to Polish, to Turkish, okay? But still, you do have this question of, do you actually assemble words? Do you store cats, like plural, as one word? Or do you actually, in fact, store it as in, in mentally uh, as cat plus plural, okay? So the question is, oh, yeah, do, you need, no, no, okay. do you want to, yeah, you can move my, you can move my, my stuff, don't, don't worry, you can move it. Yeah, I'm also, you can take my phone out if you want. Okay, all right, yeah. Okay, so um, I actually added on Virtuale, um, there's a lecture by Steven Pinker, who's actually a very good, um, he's a cognitive scientist, psychologist, linguist, who talks about um, a lot of these questions and why they are relevant. And as I said, that this is a part of a broader debate, debate in psycholinguistics and cognitive science between connectionist versus or neural network models of language versus symbolic models. And this is a topic we said um, has come back to the forefront with large language models, which are not symbolic models, they're actually connectionist models. Okay, so how is it that we learn language? language? What, are the, what are the mechanisms? How do we represent? Do we actually really represent words and words, or do we actually have um, sub-symbolic units? Okay. So um, here's a nice example of what we mean when we say um, the humans, when they know a language, they really know a generative system, okay? So this is um, a study that is still relevant today, um, and this was done by somebody called Jean Burkle Gleason, and this was part of her PhD thesis. These are her own original drawings from the 1950s, but this test is still a test that linguists use, uh, for example, to assess children, if children um, can actually productively use language, and it's called a WUG test. Okay, so we said that WUG is not a word of English, but phonologically, it's a possible word. So possible words are interesting to study because it means that you can actually ask people how would they say the plural for a word that, that they haven't heard before, hence, they cannot have learned it, okay, because they haven't been exposed to it in the input. So that's why you use these tests, okay? And I was doing, so here are the drawings. This is a WUG. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two WUGs, exactly. And you said Z and not S, because you know, you've internalized, like, the rule of English. In this case, it's a morpho-phonological rule, 
that says that the allomorph, or the, the version of the morpheme for the plural in English depends on the phonological context. context. So if the preceding sound is voiced, like g, then it's z. So it's an assimilation rule. If it were uh, wuk, it would be wux, right? And so that's a way, and this is how, in fact, uh, Jean Verko Gleason used it, was to see if little children, three, four, and five-year-olds, English-speaking children, could actually show this generalization ability. So the point was, it's not that you've just memorized words. You've got this pr productive system in your mind that allows you to do this. And the same thing for verbs in English. Okay, so this is a man who knows how to rick. He is ricking. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday, yesterday? He ricked, exactly. So that's an example of having this rule, okay? Never heard the, the verb rick before, but um, you are capable of doing this, okay? So this is a picture of Jean Berko Gleason, um, who is still, you know, like doing research in her, I guess at this point she's in her late 80s, and um, this is a nice picture. This is a very large wug. Okay, so um, this issue then of how is it that we store language, do we decompose it based on those units of analysis that linguistics pro provides us with. The question is, are these only linguistic generalizations or somehow are they at work in language use? Okay, so things like doing the wug test, all kinds of experiments, but also just observing errors. Errors where a morpheme gets separated from its stem is it's basically showing, these are, these are attested errors, somebody wanted to say pointed out, but instead said point outed. Okay, the morpheme ED, in this case, um, it, this, this um, morpheme basically switches, shifts. Okay, the morpheme by itself shifts. Something like, it probably gets out a little, it probably get outs a little, or he goes back to, he go backs a little, okay? So those are examples of morpheme level units moving around, okay? So um, these are, yeah. Have you really catch um, this shift, this morpheme shift, errors? I mean, um, it's the final ED? Yes. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yes, in this case, sometimes the morphine moves. Sometimes it's the morphine, remember we talked about last week, we said morphine stranding, where the morphine stays in place. And, um, okay, but what, what these are showing is that even in an error, these sort of have a unitary status. You don't just say, for example, shift the D by itself. It's actually, it acts, it moves as a morphine. And last week we saw, and the, the book has examples of morphemes where the morpheme shifts prior to phonological encoding. So it was something where um, I would see one if I knew it, where, I forget what the error was, it's actually in the, in the book, uh, where instead of a regular plural, the, the, so a regular verb is replaced with an irregular verb in the past. And even in the error, the form of the irregular verb, the, the verb changes to fit um, the pattern, right? So that in that case, you can tell that the morpheme error happened before phonological encoding. Thank you. Now, all of these errors are listed in the book, and all of the examples come from speech error corpora. So you see some of the same examples, because these were real things that people said and were recorded and classified in speech error corpora. And you can also have derivational, so the, the examples I've given you involve inflectional morphology, but you can also have errors in derivational morphology, even if the interpretation of the error, and this is one general problem with errors, is that sometimes it's not always obvious what the, what the nature of the error is. Is it really a um, morpheme error or is it a blend between two different uh, competing plans? Okay, so if somebody says admitting entails inserting, entails asserting. Okay, so here's an example of a speaker who was um, wanted to say admitting entails 
asserting, but instead says inserting and then self-corrects. Okay, so this is an example of a revision. Okay, and by the way, if you're doing automatic speech recognition, the transcriber, will, the ASR will transcribe everything. Will actually also transcribe the error and the revision. And here somebody wanted to say, director of instructional development, but started saying director of destructional development, okay? So again, it, this would be a morphological error. And um, sometimes you can see that if you, well, in this case, the person is monitoring, okay? There's, there's self-monitoring that corrects, and we'll talk about self-monitoring. If they had to describe, subscribe individually, they couldn't do. Okay, so the question is, well, not always easy to um, determine whether these are morphological errors or blends, or like competing plans. Um, however, people who've looked at morphological level er errors find constraints so that, for example, you can have like a prefix, prefix like um, kitten, from cat, kitten, doesn't exchange with you wouldn't have an error like kitten exchanging with gluten. Okay, sorry, the, here the, the suffix is en. Okay, so it's a derivational, uh, der derivational morphology in cat, kitten, right? But you don't see an error where the, where the same string of words is a pseudomorpheme. Okay, so there's something about the fact that en is the morphine in kitten, but not in gluten. So again, it's the same string has a different um, linguistic value in the system. Okay, so words that do not overlap after the first syllable are not involved in substitutions. Um, this is something that actually impacts communication. So we said uh, it's actually pretty common for to, so speech errors where you actually say the opposite of what you meant, okay? There's something about a semantic relationship, antonyms, but also often there's a morphological relationship, okay? So um, again, people who've looked at errors through the lens of linguistics have been interested in trying to understand, does this mean that we store words in a more abstract format? Like for example, like a negative marker plus stem um, here are more examples. I've just taken them from the book. And um, if an affix is very productive, it is more likely to be applied to novel words. And this productivity, uh, the more productive and the more sort of predictable an affix is, the more likely it is to be recognized as, an, as a unit, okay, and to participate in errors. Okay, so um, here's an example discussed in the Warren book. Um, somebody wanted to say, take the steak out of the freezer, and E-E-R is a very productive um, derivational morpheme in English. That makes it more likely to um, be recognized as a unit and move. Okay, so take the freezers out of the steak -er. Okay, so the instrumental ER is a very productive derivational morpheme. So we recognize units below the word level, and they, they are active in how we comprehend, predict, and produce language. Um, there's also evidence from errors, so lexical stress errors in English. And here are examples of putting the stress in, in, the, um, in the wrong syllable. Um, suggesting that we store stress as part of a represent phonological representation for a word. I'm going a little bit quickly now to talk, uh, to talk about phonological encoding errors. So the next few um, slides show you many examples of phonological encoding errors that we already talked about why they were important. Okay, so what is phonological encoding? Phonological encoding is when we turn um, our linguistic encoding of our, the utterance that we want to say, and this is again a simple, sim very simple example, um, right? So we have a message, we've the, a cat, there was a chasing event between a cat and a mouse, 
and um, we do all kinds of decisions. We, we, we take all kinds of decisions when we do this. We have to decide who's the subject, well, who's the agent, who's the patient, whose perspective we're going to take, how we're going to frame this, what, who's going to be the subject and who's the object, what consequence this has for the sentence that we're about to build. Okay? And then we turn it into, phonolog we retrieve the phonological code, which is still pretty abstract. Okay? It's still the input to articulation. So all of this is happening when we said it's like speaking happens in the head, including errors. Okay? Um, and if you're interpreting, you're doing this decoding, building a message, and from there planning a novel utterance from a pre-verbal message, because at that point you've Re, you've unpacked it from the order in which you took it in one to one language and you're really doing uh, message from message to phonological encoding in the other language. Okay, so um, here are examples of attested meaning um, from, from speech error people who actually you know, collected them and um, this is just taken from the book different types of sound errors and here we said that the interesting part is how far, so the scope in terms of like how, how far are the elements that are involved in sound errors. They are local, so they, they are within a syntactic phrase, okay, or between adjacent words. And for example, they do not obey um, the constraint that instead um, applies to word level errors. So word level errors, when there's a word exchange, those words tend overwhelmingly to come from the same syntactic category. So nouns with nouns, verbs with verbs. For sounds, that's not the case. Why? Because they come from words that are close by, and words that are close by often are not from the same syntactic category. Okay? So um, these are examples. Okay, so uh, errors are interesting because they're not random, and they, te they tell us something about the architecture of how it is that humans produce language. One constraint that, is, um, that operates on errors is what's called a real word bias. Okay, so that other things being equal, so errors are unintentional, okay, but still there is a tendency for what, for the output of an error, a tendency, it's not 100%, but it's a tendency, to be more likely if the output is a word instead of a non-word, okay? And you can study this experimentally and I'll show you in a minute. So, phonological errors are typically misordering errors, okay? So 50% of these errors in normal speakers who have no impairments are either anticipations and perseverations. And this kind of makes sense if you think about speaking, you're doing something sequentially where you're thinking ahead. So anticipation, anticipations are um, the a sound that you're about to produce actually gets anticipated. Like I did when I, when I did, um, when I said, uh, what did I say, long instead of wrong. Okay, so because you're, you're planning ahead. And uh, here are examples again taken from the book. We said that errors respect syllable structure constraints. For example, a syllable, a sound that occurs in an onset switches with a sound that occurs in an onset. And vowels don't switch with consonants. So if you think about it this way, a syllable is, is a frame in which the production system, our minds, are organized to fill in the slots. Okay, so this idea, this sort of slot and filler architecture, the um, slots are the positions. Here you've got C, stands for consonant B, C, and um, you're planning to produce something like this. And what can happen is you get the wrong filler, so the filler in the wrong slot. That's kind of how you understand these errors. Uh, da, 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 da. So sound errors tend to come from syllables that are either in English, 
that are either both stressed or unstressed. So you know in English, English has this pattern of, it's a stress timing language. You've all taken the phonetics and phonology of English? Phonetics and phonology of English? Have you had a little bit of phonetics and phonology of English? No? Okay. Maybe we'll do that a little bit because it's useful to un understand. Okay, so this is actually relevant to, um, so, so languages differ in terms of their timing, their rhythm. Um, so the timing in English is determined by uh, stressed, so you, you try to keep constant the time between stressed syllables and unstressed syllables get reduced in English. So you have those kinds of centralization reduction phenomena in English as opposed to Italian which is a syllable time language so you keep the, the timing of the syllables um, constant. And this has consequences for how we perceive speech and the fact that in English it's not just a question of, you know, say, well, if you speak clearly, then you have to enunciate every syllable like this. No, that actually doesn't make comprehension easier, because this stressed unstressed corresponds to pragmatic information. Okay, so in English, you convey um, discourse pragmatics, like what's new, what's old information, partly through stress. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. I'll do a, a mini lesson on English phonology. Um, two, 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 two. Okay, so these are the syllable constraints on errors, as I said. Now, this is kind of humorous. So there's a series of errors. These are phonological errors, like benign phonological error, errors, who have come, they've come to be known as spoonerisms. And Spooner was this uh, reverend, William Spooner, who was a warden at um, a college in Oxford. And he's known for having produced or made up, in fact, these sound errors that actually result in something humorous. Okay, so for example, these are classic spoonerisms attributed to Spooner. Um, the Lord is a shoving leopard. Okay, what, what do you think the, the intended utterance was? So these are sound errors. What do you think? The loving shepherd. Yes, loving shepherd, shoving leopard. You have hissed all my mystery lectures and were caught. You have... Yes, you have missed all of my history lectures. Okay, so sound, sound errors. Okay? Um, and then, and were caught fighting a liar. I mean, obviously this is made up. Okay, he's using it for like, um, you know, but it, but it is a possible error. We're caught fighting a liar in the quad. What do you think? Lighting a fire. Lighting a fire, yes. Having tasted two worms, you will leave the next town drain. <laughs> Having Waste. wasted, yes, two terms, you will leave by the next no. town train. Yes, okay. So those are fairly um, sort of humorous, um, but they show this property, which is common in, in um, phonological errors, onsets, okay, so onset switching. So word onsets are important, they're important in production, they're also important in comprehension, and we'll see that in fact the way we recognize words doesn't occur, we don't wait till the end of the word to recognize a word. Onsets are really important. They are very important. And spoken word recognition. So there are also constraints on errors. Somebody asked me this, I think, the first class. Okay, so is there an effect of similarity? Do, constant, do sounds that are more similar switch with, with one another? Yes. Okay, so there is an effect of phon phonetic uh, and phonological similar similarity and contextual similarity. So sounds that will occupy similar positions in the syllable structure are more likely to um, switch, suggesting that the way that we encode language for production at the phonological level obeys sort of this idea that you have slots that you've planned 
that, for example, the representation is something a little bit ab abstract, like C, V, C, for example, and then you fill in the sounds, okay? So you've got this little template that you then insert sounds in, okay? So speakers line up words for production, and we know this from word exchanges, and then uh, we phonologically encode words, and so um, there's sort of this architecture through the system. Okay, so we said that there's also what's called this real world word bias in errors, so that errors are more likely to result in a real word than a noun word. Okay, so why could this be? Well, it's possible. One possibility is that we only hear, so there's a perceptual um, sort of a perceptual bias that we only hear or that we're more likely to notice errors that result in words. Okay, so a bias in the listener. But there could also be a component that has to do with the speaker. So do we monitor our own speech prior to production? Okay, so it could be both of these things. Okay, and how would we study this? Okay, so um, has anybody ever heard of tongue twisters? Tongue twisters, shall you be with? Yes, yes. Now, tongue twisters are very interesting. You can actually study tongue twisters experimentally, and tongue twisters elicit errors. We make errors in tongue twisters. Interesting thing, though, is you actually make errors even if you silently imagine saying the tongue twisters. Okay, so if you try that, and they've done this, they've called people in the lab and asked them to imagine saying these tongue twisters and then note er the errors. People produce errors when they imagine saying tongue, tw tongue twisters. Okay, so when I said errors happen in the mind, they're not something that has to do with articulation. But you can study tongue twisters and uh, people who've looked at this experimentally, for example, are interested in looking at you can even do brain imaging studies when people produce tongue twisters. And the question is, we want to know how far do we plan speech? How detailed is that representation prior to speaking? All kinds of interesting questions. Okay, so tongue twisters can shed light into the brain's speech planning processes. Um, so people who've looked at this in the lab, we said experiments in the lab, you create your stimuli, okay? So here, the study looked at uh, pa and fa, okay? So the question is, um, pa and fa are similar sounds and they tend to switch in spoonerisms. But does that mean that they switch irrespective of what position they're in in the syllable? How would I know this? The only way to do this is to set up an experiment where you actually put pa and fa in different positions in uh, words. Okay, so you have the first one, you've got pa and fa are both in the same position, first word, um, word position, first syllable, and in parrot and fad, those are stressed syllables in English. Okay, so if I say parrot, fad, so word position and stress are the same. And then here, parade and fad, okay, they're both in the same word position, but stress position is different. Okay, this is an example of what people do when they do an experiment. You have to set up all of the conditions. So in parade, per is an, per occurs in, a, in an unstressed syllable. How do I know that? Because I say parade, not parade. Okay, parade. Second. Yes, it's on the, exactly, exactly. We actually, you know, we, we, we sort of have intuitions about, we know we're syllable stretch. So, parrot, parade. Okay, so for those of you who've done a bit of phonology, you notice that when I say in English, if I stress a syllable, the vowel quality is full. I say parrot, but I say parade. So in the, when the syllable is, is unstressed in English, the vowel becomes schwa. That's kind of a general thing in, in English. Okay, that's, 
So um, then we put it in stress position the same, but word position is different. So pa in repeat is in a stress syllable. So pa occurs in a stress syllable, but it's not the same position. So fa is in, um, so stress position is the same, but word position is different. And then you put a condition where stress is different and word position is different. Well, it turns out that pa and fa actually switch more often when word position and stress position are the same, okay? So this is a simple example of how you go from observing things occurring naturalistically in errors to actually setting up experiments. And this is what people do when they do experiments. So you can even do experiments with tongue twisters. They, they, they seem like a you know, silly thing to do, but they actually can tell you a lot. Okay, so you can test hypotheses, and as I said, results from experiments are complementary to observational methods like errors. Okay, so you can ask, are some conditions more likely to produce errors than others, etc. So, in fact, studies like this have shown that errors, sound errors, happen more between sounds that begin stress syllables than between a sound that begins a stressed syllable and another that begins an unstressed syllable. So this tells us something about how speakers mentally represent words. Now, we are moving on to the content of the other question of, like, do speakers monitor their speech? And if they do, what's the nature of that monitor? How far do they, do they monitor? And why do they monitor? So monitoring and repair. So, um, there's all kinds of evidence from any, any time you record somebody that they do monitor and repair their language, okay? But they actually monitor and repair at different levels in language production. So they monitor for the message. So here's an example from the short monologue, the, the one that we listened to in class where the guy says, so I arrived in Rome, in Rome, airport is not actually in Rome. So here he's reformulating, and then he starts saying, in order to be, whereas to actually, to get into, okay, so you check your message for content, to check if what, if what you're saying actually matches what you intend to say, or, for example, this is something anybody does a lot, if, especially if you're lecturing, you reformulate, you look at your audience, you look at people's eyes, and like, are they looking like that? And you think, okay, I have to say this, can I say this differently? Okay, so speakers check to see if there's a better way to present their information. And they also monitor for errors. Okay, so if they say the wrong word, the syntax, the morphology, the phonology. And one question is, again, to what extent do speakers take their addressees into consideration. Okay, so um, you can actually study this by looking at different communicative situations and checking how much speakers monitor. Now, we're going to do a little experiment in class. Okay, so um, this is called the slip technique. So, this technique called spoonerisms of laboratory-induced predisposition can be used to see whether speakers monitor. For, so it, it's a technique that elicits errors, sound errors, okay? And then you can set up all kinds of constraints on the words, on the content, and so on, and see whether, well, you collect errors, and then you look at what factors mediate this. Okay, so the technique involves doing this. Okay, you have to say the word silently as quickly as you can, and then when you hear a tone, you say it out, you say it aloud. Okay, so you'll see pairs of words, and the, the participant is asked to just read them silently. And then when there's a tone, you have to say it out loud. Yeah, you hear like a, you know, a sound. What did you think the tone was? Oh, like a beep, something like that, a sound. Okay. <laughs> you hear a tone, yeah. or oh, sound, or it could it could also be some cue. Oh, 
Oh, oh sorry. I didn't play the tone. The tone didn't play. The tone didn't play. Ah. What happened? Okay, so you see a sequence of words that all start they, they're with a pattern. Sha ha in this case. Sha ha sha ha sha ha. Then you see a word sequence where it's ha sha. And you've sort of primed this pattern, this sequence, that you, you're going to see words, for example, right, in this case, uh, sha, ha. And then the, the last one, the one that you have to say out loud, reverses that pattern. And it makes it more likely that you say errors, because you've sort of primed the sha, ha, and then you hear ha, sha, and then you switch. Okay? That's how it works. Hot shirt. Okay, so here the error, when you produce the error, would be shot, hurt. Okay, that's what people do. So the sound didn't, didn't come up. Okay, okay so um, here you have in this full experiment, the experiment is built up so that in one case, the error that you produce results in a real word. Okay, and in the other condition, it would result in a non-word sequence. And then you ask, if there's this lexical bias in the monitor, uh, uh, errors, the proportion of errors that you produce, more likely to occur when the error results in a real word versus when it doesn't. Okay, so you can answer this question experimentally. So, the, so is the real word <laughs> bias real? I can test it experimentally, okay? Turns out the difference between these two Right? So, hot shirt would result in shot hurt with the two sounds, benign spoonerism, phonological error. And for hide shame, shide hame, shide hame contains two non words. Okay? So, when you do this experimentally with lots of trials and so on, lots of people, lots of, not, not just sh and ha, you can do it with all kinds of sounds, you actually find that, in fact, speakers are more likely to produce an error when the resulting error is actually a real word. Okay, so this was a study done in the 70s that the, um, so when, it, when the error resulted in a word, this accounted for 20% of the errors compared to 6% when it was a non-word. Okay, so there's this bias for errors to, to um, result in existing words. Okay? And the explanation that Motley and Boris had for this was that speakers unconsciously, there's this sort of filter, let's say that your monitor, your language production monitor that you're not aware of, is sensitive to the lexical status of the uh, error, which is kind of interesting, right? You can also um, test for all kinds of other uh, influences. Okay, so um, this idea that we have in our heads a monitoring stage for production that is sensitive to lexical status and also as to whether a word in an error, remember we said errors are also phonologically constrained. They tend to result in things that are plausible, possible words in a language. Okay, so we do produce errors that are non-words, but they tend to be respect the phonotactics of the language. And for linguists, this is really interesting because it sort of gets to the question of like, what, what is the nature of the architecture of the language in our heads? Okay, so linguists are interested in finding out whether errors always respect the phonotactics on the tactics of the language or not. Okay, it's a window onto how we represent language. But for us people interested in speaking, it's sort of saying, well, we monitor, we also have this internal monitor for our production system. Now, what else is monitored? Okay, so here's a warning that the next slides contain contextually inappropriate or taboo language. Okay, so, um, I'm just going to show them to you. Okay, so um, people who've also looked at whether you, you probably prior to 
psycholinguistics, you've probably heard of Freudian speech errors. Elapsus Freudiani. When you say something like that, right? That sort of um, the idea Freud was interested in in speech errors because he thought that they um, gave they manifested repressed intentions. Now, psycholinguists are also interested in speech errors as a window onto unconscious processes, but the unconscious processes that psycholinguists are interested in are the ones that have to do with language production. Okay. And how do you say in English? Freudian slips. Freudian slips. Yes, Freudian slips. Um, so that was an area where it, the interest in speech errors scientifically started at the beginning of, it was in the 1800s, and they were both of interest both to psychoanalysts and psychiatrists and philologists. So philologists were interested in errors to ask questions about the building blocks of language and you know, sort of uh, that uh, angle. And um, psychiatrists were interested in, in speech errors for this other reason. Okay, so. Um, okay. What would the error be here? <laughs> shithead. Shithead, okay. Yes, shithead. We're allowed to say shithead in, in class, okay? So um, this is, you know, it's relatively benign. <laughs> okay, anyway, Motley, Camden, and Bars did this and found that slips that resulted in, tab in a taboo word occurred only 4% of the time, okay? Even if these were words, these are words, shithead is a word, I mean, they're both words, you have to compare this to the 20% of when it's not taboo, okay? So there's this monitor, and this is unconscious, people are not producing errors consciously, okay? But there's this, the idea is that you have this monitoring um, going on too. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, for the fact that uh, it is a taboo, yes. um, like are uh, the errors more likely to be done or less? Well, in this case, less. Okay, okay in, this, in, in this case, they were less likely to be done in that particular case. But Motley then also went on and did an interesting study uh, trying to set up, like to see, to elicit like those Freudian errors. So he actually had, and he actually found out, he found that in, under some conditions, specifically like anxiety, uh, you produce more more errors. Okay, so a anxiety set up made, made sexual errors or any kind of error, even taboo ones, more likely. Okay, so that's interesting. So he did this. He set up. This was done in the 80s. Okay, that people were really sexist back then. I mean, they're so sexist now, but I mean, in the 80s, uh, you could do this. Okay, so type of spoonerism. So whether the domain. Um, was electricity or attractive women. And then they actually set this up, they brought people in the lab and they pretended to um, connect them to a, something that gave a little electrical shock. Or in another condition, they actually had the experiment, somebody came into the lab and they were greeted by a provocatively dressed experimenter, kind of the idea to prime the idea of attractive women in the, in the they were doing, this is how, what they did. And then they actually had a taboo word occur either early versus late in the error, okay? So they set up all of these conditions and this is what they did. These were the kind of stimuli. Okay, well, you can predict what the error was in that, in that case, okay? And then they looked at, um, they, had, they, they found an effect of context, okay? So more errors in the contextually primed condition. So if you, like, if the topic was electricity and you were in the condition where you thought you were receiving an, an electric, so the context, the setting, made that content salient, okay? Or if participants were greeted by an attractive experimenter, they made more of those, like, errors, okay? So, and 
errors occurred more if the taboo word was the first one compared to the second one. So, like, you didn't have time to monitor, okay? But they found more partial errors if the taboo word was the second word. These are kind of, um, okay, so then they went on, as I was saying, I anticipated the finding. They wanted to find out whether you could actually elicit these Freudian errors. And they had a hypothesis that they then sort of tested. So their hypothesis was that um, if people had high sex anxiety, they would make more sex spoonerisms than those with low sex anxiety. So they brought in, they did this with males only, and they <coughs> uh, administered a questionnaire asking people about questions about sex um, anxiety. And then they, the participants who were rated to be having either high, medium, or low sex anxiety participated in the slip task, and they collected, they looked at how many slips they made. Okay? So they asked questions about, I don't know what the questionnaire was, but something about, with questions related to sex. I don't know what the questionnaire, okay? So it was to say, um, like a lot of, you know, these questionnaires, they ask you, uh, you know, how comfortable are you with this, etc. Exactly, right? To have some measure of your sex anxiety or etc. I have a question about yeah. the people that responded. Yeah. Do they have a study about um, what happened neurologically? Okay, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. This was done behaviorally, right? Simply, you, you just do it behaviorally, you, you set up even, you know, like a... It, it, and it, you know, so this is an example of, the, you can actually get questions that have to do, not, that don't just have to do with language, by showing people words. Okay, so you can show words that are, you know, taboo words, or words that are negative, positive, so you can play with what's called the valency, or the emotional valency of a word, and see how people react. And it can also be a window, not just onto language, but also um, our attitudes towards people. So there's a, another type of experimental task that measures your reaction time. It's saying whether a word is a word or not, depending on what words you've heard before and how fast you are making those decisions. It, um, it's been used in what's called an implicit attitude test to see how biased you are towards, um, you know, groups, okay? So you, you can do things that, um, using words that, that get at questions that have to do with emotion, cognition in general, and social, social attitudes. Okay, so what they found was that people who um, had high sex and anxiety produced more errors those participants than the ones who had medium sex anxiety as revealed by the questionnaire compared to low. And overall, these so-called sex spoonerisms, the ones that resulted in like, you know, saying, um, is it cool tits instead of um, toolkits? That's, that's how, you know. Um, they occurred more frequently than those neutral spoonerisms. And so in the discussion of the paper, they say, well, maybe it's true, you know, maybe Freud's idea was that sexual anxiety um, could be studied through speech errors. Okay, that's why Freud was uh, interested in speech errors. So but Motley and Barr say, well, it's possible that Freud was right. However, um, Barr's and Motley went on to test a more general hypothesis, that anxiety in general. So if you're in an anxious state, okay, any type of anxiety, not just sexual anxiety, makes it more likely to produce errors. Remember when we were talking about presidential errors or errors made by speakers who are, you know, like politicians and so on. And think of, so the point here is that errors might actually make, sorry, stress or anxiety or tiredness make the errors more likely. They don't change the nature of the error, but you have this lexical bias effect, you've got spoonerisms, you've got the fact that often um, some of the errors, for example, substituting a president's name with somebody else's name, we said last week, names are stored in, in their own like network. Okay, so 
similarity space. Proper names are more likely to be exchanged with other proper names. So it's interesting that we sort of read into, you know, all kinds of, well, for Biden, it was, you know, whether Biden was fit to run for president. Um, you, you can make that decision on lots of elements, but not from his speech errors, right? Think about somebody who's running for office, like the amount of pressure they're under, they're under and that will make errors more likely, okay? So you can also study these things then experimentally. So it's showing you that you observe something, then you can set up experimental conditions. And you can do this with interpreting too, right? So the interest of the interest in psycholinguistics for the field of interpreting is that a lot of these methods you can then apply to the types of tasks interpreters or translators or mediators do, okay? So, um, back to the big picture on errors. Errors have provided data about the units of language production. And uh, looking at the units that evolved in speech errors, we can see that those actually tend to correspond to what linguists have identified in different areas of linguistics, like phonology, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics. And they have provided important data to understand the basic architecture, meaning cognitive architecture for how humans speak. This idea of the two-stage model, where we have a stage that's involved with semantic, syntactic kind of units, and a stage that's involved with phonologically encoding. Um, and now people do think experiments, they do much more sophisticated experiments, they do um, brain imaging experiments. With, with, with language production, we're very often interested in the timing of how far people plan. So to get at measures of time course, meaning timing, one very useful technique is to use eye tracking, or things that actually give you the millisecond by millisecond timing of uh, events, okay? Um, but taken together, we want to think of all of these sources of data. There's not just one source of evidence that is uh, better than others. We said observational methods, corpora, etc., are rich in ecological validity, and experimental data are rich in experimental control. They can, you know, I've shown you the example from the slip, from slips of the tongue. You can test these hypotheses about what makes an error more likely. So these are examples of ways that we um, study these questions. Okay, it is now 12. So this is uh, the chapter on speech error repairs. Okay, so it's chapter number seven, either six or seven. Either, it's the one before gesture, the chapter before S for gesture. So, um, one way that people have looked at whether speakers repair and how they go about repairing is by setting up experimental protocols. Okay, we want to know where people go back and repair. And one way to do this, and we said one of the difficult, the challenges to studying language production is that you have oftentimes two things going on. The message, which is variable, and then the encoding of the message. So one experimental technique used by people who study production, including people who study interpreting in production, is to keep the message constant so that we know what we're talking about, and then vary the production conditions, okay? So, Levelt, who's done a, a lot of the work in language production going back to the 70s and 80s, um, set up this kind of task. It's a network description task where somebody has to give directions to somebody else and how to navigate through a network. Okay, so you give these sort of, from the point of view of content, they're not particularly interesting tasks. 
but they allow you to look, to zoom in, because you know what the message is. You know here there's a visual display, you have to tell somebody how to navigate through the network. So it means that the experimenter knows what the message is and then can actually look at what happens in the grammatical encoding stage. So, um, Levelt introduced this distinction between a repair and a revision. Okay, so a repair is the correction of an error that is detected at some point by the speaker, usually quickly. Okay, so here's an example from this network uh, description task. So go from the red dot to the uh, to the uh, to the green dot. Okay, so the person was going to say go for, wanted to say go from the red dot to the green dot, but instead says yellow. So they start uttering yeah, and then they correct. That's an example of a repair. I've monitored, I've detected my error, and speakers do this all the time, right? They start and then they stop. They don't say the whole the whole word. Interestingly, if you do automatic speech recognition, I've actually I've, I've started looking at how many of the errors automatic speech recognition actually, um, well, because it's working continuously, so it's transcribing anything it sees. It does have, depending on the language model, if it has a language model plugged in, then it will, you know, produce the, the full error or it'll think that it's a word and actually put in a word, right? So depending on the, if, if it has a, lex, a language model that, that has this lexical bias, it will actually produce, right, type out a word. Um, so repairs happen right away. Here's an example, speakers repairing. A revision instead happens when the speaker goes back and reformulates, okay? So here the speaker again, an, an example um, taken from the Levelt study, from the light blue dot, go down to another dot, which is dark blue. Now go left from the blue, the dark blue dot to a brown dot. Okay, so here the speaker figures out that there's, they, they reformulate what they want to say. And in fact, the speaker doesn't say from the blue dark blue, the speaker actually goes back and reproduces the whole, in this case, phrase. They also include the determiner in. So it's actually doing, it's giving you revising, I mean, in this case, it's only uh, starting from the beginning of the noun phrase, or we'll call it the determiner phrase, but they're actually uh, doing something that's also sort of syntactic. It's going to the last syntactic unit and restarting from that syntactic unit. Okay, so instead of saying, they don't say the blue, dark blue. No, the speaker goes back and restarts the, the last syntactic phrase, the dot, blue dot. And this is actually a pretty consistent pattern in these kinds of revisions. So revisions tend to go back to the last uh, syntactic unit and restart it. And all of this is sort of done unconsciously. We're not, the speaker isn't aware that they're doing this. Okay? So here is, this picture is taken from the book, I call it Anatomy of a Repair. I mean, what are the, the phases of the repair? Okay, so there's three phases. The interruption, the editing, and the repair. So, the interruption, go from the red dot to the y. Here we've got interruption. The editing expression, in this case it's like that filled pause a uh, in English, and then to the green dot. So this is how um, and the repair is to the green dot. Again, see here, they start out from uh, the two. There are also so-called covert repairs. So this is, you don't know um, that there's actually a repair going on because the speaker is doing it internally. And what you hear is a long pause. Okay, so speakers repair as soon as they de detect an error. This is constraint. And this um, about uh, a quarter, 25% of the times, happen without 
any speech. So you hear to the left of the, of the red dot there is a long pause. The speaker is actually doing this editing, the green dot. Now, pause phenomena, we said, are also subject to interpretation issues. So here, is, are they really doing an overt repair or is the speaker hesitating because of a lexical access difficulty, okay? So there's that indeterminacy in, in pauses, in patterns of pauses. Okay, so it could also uh, reflect lexical decision uncertainties or difficulties. So overt repairs are difficult to interpret. Okay, so because of the difficulties in interpreting them, we want to know what they really do, we actually have to sort of constrain, uh, um, limit ourselves to visible repairs. So these are studies done by Levelt, again looking at when do repairs occur. So um, Levelt found that about half of the repairs follow the error, probably because they're detected late. And late, these late repairs tend to disrupt the production of the grammatical constituent you're working on. And so some of these repairs happen later than the word, and roughly um, 18 or 20 percent of the error of the repairs actually occurred on the word it's itself. Okay. And interruptions on, on words are more frequent if the word itself needs repair than revision. So you tend to repair the word when you said the wrong word rather than when you said you produce something that you want to reformulate. So if your thought or your message was incomplete, you don't tend to go and repair the word. Okay? So you can produce a speech error on a word. You can say what, what, whatever reason and interrupt yourself on the word to repair the word. Now, editing expressions vary cross-linguistically. So they tend to resemble those filled pauses. Okay, so for English, the filled pauses are uh and um. Okay, Italian, they'll be different. Eh, uh, so with the vowels of, of um, the language. And um, as we said, interruptions on words are more frequent if the word needs a repair than a revision. And here are again the Levelt data looking at whether uh, repairs versus revisions had editing expressions. So 62% of repairs had an editing expression, example, to the year, uh, to the green dot, and 28% of revisions had an editing expression. Automatic speech recognition systems transcribe these editing expressions. They transcribe um, for example. You'll see that for English. Now, the question is, who are these editing expressions there for? So, editing expressions in repairs may not actually, actually be there for the listener, okay? So, they may be listener-oriented, signaling to the listener a change in the plan, a change in the unfolding utterance, saying, wait a minute, okay, I am reformulating so it's giving the listener a cue that you're going to reformulate. So a change in the unfolding utterance. So it's interesting that although unconscious in the sense that you're not deliberately saying um, and it could signal your lexical access difficulties and so on, at the same time, those expressions also have a communicative function. They're telling the listener something's coming up there's an error, I'm revising, etc. So, although when we speak, I know my mom always tells me, oh, don't say um, you know, if I'm preparing a speech. And then I think, well, it's okay to say um. It's actually maybe, it's, it's, it's physiological, and it might actually have a communicative function, because my listener will tune into it and know, okay? So, 
then the question is, would you leave them in in an automatic speech recognition system or do you want to clean it out? Now, obviously, when we see these words transcribed and we make the transcript look messy, you know, <laughs> but when we're reading, we're doing something different. So it's kind of interesting when you've got a transcript of a real speech, should you leave these editing expressions in or not? I guess it depends on the purpose of the transcription, exactly. Okay. Okay, so here are studies that looked at different kinds of editing expressions in English. Study um, by James. So, uh and er, uh, the speaker's retrieving some, something, lexical access difficulty. So, I saw 12 people at the party. Um, another expression is that is. So, the speaker use, uses a pronoun. So, he hit Mary, that is, Bill did. Or rather, these are all in English, okay? So, I am trying to lease, or rather, sublease my apartment. And then I mean, that's ubiquitous, I beg to present to you my half-warmed fish, I mean my half, my half-formed wish. Okay, so these are common ones for English. Could you say that, um, I mean, uh, is more, like, it has more meaning than, um... Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, can you, can you say that again? Yeah, like, um, it's better, it's better saying, I mean, uh, than, uh, um, um, I don't know, person. what do you think? What do people think? I think both are the end one. Then, you really, I think that says, you know, um, it's not seen so good, you know, when you know, it seems like, you know, a clear idea of what you're talking about. Yes. So usually I think, I mean, but if you say I mean a lot, then that gets annoying, yeah, becomes yeah. annoying. <laughs> it takes less time to say it. Yes. So the dialogue maybe can continue better than I mean. It's, I believe in your mind, even if you say I mean, you do a little pause, and sometimes you produce the, the sound. I mean. <laughs> well, I think if you look at it ecologically, saying, well, speaking is hard, even if you know what you want, you know the meaning. You know the meaning, the meaning, and you're actually searching for words, you're also not only doing searching for words, but you're also trying to find, you're doing it on the fly, and you're also often with feedback, depending on the condition and um, the situation, feedback from your interlocutor, you're finding better ways to say something. So the problem isn't your message, it's the grammatical and phonological encoding stage. So if this process, which is non-trivial, you know, I don't know what's happening out there, non-trivial process that we take for granted, then maybe we should think that somebody saying um is basically telling the listener, I'm looking either for a better way to say this or that word isn't accessible at the moment. Okay, so looked at it this way, I think we should just take these signals for you know something that's telling us something about how our minds work and to be patient about it. I, that's my. <laughs> how, how we go in, in these expressions? Uh, I mean, Phil. Uh, okay, uh, those would be. Okay, that would be a filler. In, I mean, in some sense, um is different. Even um, if you look at it this way, is as you were saying, it's a short, it's a syllable. It's not like some universal expression that's the same for all languages. So different languages have these, I would even call it a particle in some sense. It's like a, a discourse particle suggesting, saying something that you're temporarily either looking for a word. Because if you don't, if you don't say anything, if you just have silence, then, you know, that's also disorienting from the point of view of the listener. If I talk and then I pause and Sometimes you don't want to pause because 
depending on the, again, it really depends on the genre. If you're doing a dialogue in a, in a conversation, some t pausing is also a sign of turn taking. So the other person will <laughs> jump in and you don't want to do that because maybe you don't want to cede the floor. Okay, so uh, I know we have this bias towards thinking that um, and so on, that those are like disfluencies. But I think there's a perspective from language production research that says, no, actually those have a function. And I think that's an interesting perspective to have, to say, to, to be sort of non-judgmental about them. Yeah, sure, if we, if we have a prepared speech and we're reading it, you don't want to, um, and so on, okay? But when you do speak English, you're using the ones that are appropriate for English. So um, you don't say um, you'll say um, you said uh, <laughs> you didn't say um. Okay, so you actually produce. So the um, what I'm saying is, it's no different than saying I mean, and it's shorter. It's not that it just because it has a schwa and a m, that doesn't make it a non-word. It's actually kind of a discourse. Particle, in a way, I would say that that's actually a, a discourse particle that's signaling something that can have something that's telling the listener. It's there for the listener saying, "Wait a minute, stop." Okay, and that can actually be very useful to an interpreter because it's saying, "All right, this is where <laughs> my speaker is going to reformulate." Right? It's signaling something so that you can pay attention to them, sort of think of them as things that are sort of listener-oriented. And, um, um, <laughs> so you're going to love um, by the end of this class. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes things that we think are there and are sort of like behaviors that we think should be extinguished. Now I'm thinking, for example, well, certain behaviors in, in people with speech um, issues that you think, oh, I should actually try to correct that, as opposed to saying, no, I should actually accept that. I should accept that that's the way the person talks, and I shouldn't try to impose like some norm of what you know clear clear thinking is. One, we said speaking isn't the same thing as speak, speaking isn't the same thing as, as thinking, so we shouldn't attribute poor thinking based on the fact that somebody produces arms, that's not what it's reflecting. Okay, so a more, I guess, ecological, and sort of ask ourselves, like, what, it, what function does this expression serve? What is it reflecting in the mind of the speaker? And is it also there for the listener? Because speakers are also comprehenders, right? We're doing, we're doing both. So that's um, what I, I think is interesting about this research. So, yes? Yeah, like my mom. My mom tells me to stop doing um. <laughs> Now you you can think. Well, you want to know. I, I mean, I can understand the thinking that you've got this very fluent speech and so on. But what is the price for that? Okay, you want to be you want to balance being prepared with being spontaneous. If we were to eliminate all the arms, we'd be really reading our speeches. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. If you have a very short amount of time and you don't want to take up time with ums, then you do super prepare. Like if I'm giving a, a talk where my time is really limited and 
I'll write it or rehearse it so much that I am no longer, you know, I'm just reciting from memory, basically. Okay, and then your arms will go away. So, but when you're doing something that's extemporaneous, then it's, you're inevitably going to produce these fillers because of various reasons, including competing plans, but also the fact that so many words are activating and competing, and you have to select the right one at the right time. And that's actually a very difficult. I think speaking is probably, I mean, it's a really, really cognitively intense, very, very difficult, possibly sometimes harder. I mean, the constraints are different from listening, because listening, Yes, you have to decode the input and so on. But in speaking, you actually have to produce something. And that has to come out in the right order, with the elements in the right order. So you're under a time pressure, and you have to linearize, ultimately linear. <laughs> I'll get that word right, eventually. Linearize, okay, under time pressure. So the ums are there for, for good reason. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we said this about what happens when people repair. So, speakers and studies have looked at this. Again, these are empirical studies done by William Levelt. He's written an amazing, it's an old book called Speaking from Intention to Articulation. It's like an 800 page book, a 600 page book. It's a really, really, really great book. Um, so, he found that errors tend to restart from form a grammatically complete structure when, when joined with the repair. So the example was um, going back to the initial constituent. Then um, speakers, again, this is English data done by Cutler and the Welt at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands, speakers are more likely to place emphasis, typo, emphasis on the repair word. So 38% repair words errors are emphasized. I don't know, here's a typo, I did it twice. So this prosodic marking on repair words is likely to be there for the less. Prosodic means I put stress on, I actually do something. So it tells the listener to overwrite the error. It's basically saying, okay, I'm going back, I'm re-saying this. Okay, so it's telling the listener to overwrite the error. Why? Well, because having heard the wrong word can have consequences for the unfolding comprehension of the message. Okay, so what the speaker is intending to say. So stress placement errors in English are more likely to be repaired if the stress placement error changes the quality of the vowel. Okay, so vowels in English carry important information. Oh, 1230. Okay. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> we will do this um, gesture next week. Oh, sorry, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. We'll finish gesture. All right, see you um, tomorrow. Bye.